Previously, we used to feed them three times a day. Today, these high production groups are being fed six times a day. Today, we work with three different diets, a high production diet, a mid production diet for groups producing approximately 42 to 45 kilograms of milk, and a postpartum diet. Another critical factor is particle size, both for corn silage and pre-dried forages, which we classify as long fiber. Jesse sent a message saying that he won't be making videos anymore because you haven't subscribed to the Santa Fe channel. So subscribe now, and he will continue recording on farms around the world. My name is Nato Carvalho, and I am the Livestock Manager here at Colorado Farm. We are currently in the lactating cow production area, and I'd like to share a bit about our current feeding program. Today we work with three different diets, a high production diet designed for herds averaging around 52 kilograms of milk per cow per day, a mid-production diet for groups producing approximately 42 to 45 kilograms of milk, and a postpartum diet. All of these diets are composed of corn silage, pre-dried tifton grass, wet barley from brewery byproducts, whole cottonseed, citrus pulp, ground corn, soybean meal, and high bypass protein soybean meal, referred to here as CPs. We also include rumen inert fat, macro and micro minerals, vitamins, and several nutritional additives. These ingredients collectively constitute the dietary base for our lactating animals. The key distinction lies in the postpartum diet, where we incorporate specific feed additives, particularly choline and methionine. Among all additives, these are perhaps the most differentiated in terms of their targeted use during this phase. The animals are grouped not only by milk production level, but also by parity, meaning primiparous and multiparous are managed separately. Herd management is carried out on an almost weekly basis as we are currently experiencing a high volume of calvings. One of our present challenges is overcrowding, which compels us to be not necessarily more efficient, but certainly more agile in our decision-making regarding herd management. We generally consider it undesirable to have to move animals frequently. The less movement, the better. However, current conditions demand greater responsiveness. We are aware that there is a degree of social stress and adaptation when animals are moved from one group to another. However, Within the reality of the farm, there are times of the year when we face cases of hemorrhagic jejunal syndrome, and this remains a condition for which we have yet to determine whether it is a cause or a consequence of other factors. When we examine manure consistency, rumen activity, and even milk fat levels, the animals appear to be healthy, at least according to nutritional indicators, which suggest that the nutrient supply is adequate. One possible hypothesis is that overcrowding is a contributing factor. We are currently facing overstocking levels of up to 30%, which undoubtedly alters animal behavior, including their access to the feed bunk. This leads animals to rush their intake whenever they have the opportunity to feed, and as a result, it can sharply reduce ruminal pH, which may in turn be linked to the condition. Another possible contributing factor is the presence of mold or heating in silage. At times we are required to produce silage in bunker silos, and even though we try to manage it as effectively as possible, it is nearly impossible to be 100% efficient in preventing issues during silage transition phases. Feed refusal is something that concerns me here. One thing we detected was that during a specific period at night, we were pushing up the feed but by morning the feed was found to be far from the feed bunk. This suggests that intake is not necessarily low, but rather that the cows did not have proper access to the feed. We have since adjusted this practice, and we will now complete the evaluation at the end of March to determine whether this correction has resolved the issue. Still, this is a point that I find concerning. Displaced abomasum is generally well controlled here, with an incidence of less than 1%. When it does occur, it is often closely associated with stocking density, which continues to be one of our greatest challenges. 
Displacement is not always linked to diet. Factors such as grouping strategy and feed bunk space availability may also play a causative role in such occurrences. From a broader herd health perspective, hoof care is currently an area where we face some management difficulties, primarily due to insufficient labor. Often we are required to reassign staff from one department to another, which causes delays in preventive hoof trimming. We are currently reorganizing our workforce to address this issue and optimize hoof trimming schedules. When I first arrived here, this was one of the critical areas I focused on, especially considering the overcrowding issue. One of the strategies I implemented was to increase feed delivery frequency. We used to feed the high producing groups three times per day, and today we feed them six times per day. Improving intake dynamics and performance under high density conditions. Here, in addition to the use of the feed mixer wagon, we also rely on a bobcat, which has the specific function of pushing up the feed along the feed bunk. Our protocol is that approximately 30 to 40 minutes after the diet has been distributed, the bobcat operator must return and push the feed closer to the cows. After that, feed is pushed every hour or sooner. If the operator visually observes that the feed has shifted out of reach. Whenever we formulate a new diet, we begin with a nutritional analysis of the forages. As for the concentrates, such as corn and soybean meal, we typically use standardized values, so those ingredients are sampled less frequently. Because we have a large herd and high silage intake, we regularly analyze both the corn silage and the pre-dried Tifton grass. In the case of the Tifton, we run analyses every 15 days since its inclusion rate in the total mixed ration is relatively low. For this reason, we believe that variations in its composition are unlikely to cause significant nutritional imbalances. As for corn silage, we make a point of analyzing it once a week since it tends to show greater variability. What we generally monitor includes starch content, neutral detergent fiber, NDF, fiber digestibility, and dry matter, which we measure routinely here on the farm. We also submit samples to an external laboratory where we request a full nutritional profile. One particular parameter I always like to evaluate is indigestible NDF at 240 hours because it helps me assess the potential limitation of digestible NDF intake which typically ranges from 0.3 to 0.4% of body weight. I use this information to determine whether the diet is properly balanced and will not limit voluntary intake. This is something I monitor closely. Another important point is that many people focus on starch content, but in my opinion, starch digestibility is even more important than the absolute starch concentration. If I am working with a highly degradable starch, I also need to carefully monitor physically effective NDF, digestible NDF, and effective NDF, as all of these are directly linked to rumen health. For example, when feeding high moisture corn, I have to balance it with a specific level of fermentable starch. For high producing cows, I work with a maximum of 19% fermentable starch. For mid to low producing groups, I can work with levels around 16 to 15%, always prioritizing safety. That 19% is my personal upper limit. Another factor that limits my ability to increase fermentable starch is stocking density. This presents a challenge from both a management standpoint and a health risk perspective, especially in terms of preventing subacute ruminal acidosis because of that, I tend to be more conservative when it comes to starch levels. Currently, the total starch content of the diet is approximately 27%, which is the maximum I work with here. I know that some operations reach as high as 30%, but for reasons of prudence and animal safety, I do not push to that level. Once again, I always prioritize fermentable starch over total starch content, as I believe it is the more relevant parameter. What are the consequences of exceeding the recommended starch levels? The consequence is excessive fermentation, 
leading to a drop in ruminal pH and triggering problems such as acidosis. That results in milk fat depression and reduced ruminal activity. In some cases, it may also contribute to issues like hoof problems, although I believe those are more multifactorial and not caused exclusively by acidosis. In my opinion, for a cow to develop laminitis, she would need to remain in chronic acidosis for an extended period. In the short term, the most immediate signs are milk fat depression and diarrhea, which are my primary concerns when working with higher starch levels. It's also worth noting that this farm operates its own dairy processing plant, meaning we have a vertically integrated system and one of our products is cream. Therefore, maintaining high milk solids, especially fat content, is essential. That's why I am particularly cautious when it comes to managing starch levels in the diet. Fecal scoring, in my opinion, is a crucial diagnostic tool for evaluating the effectiveness of the diet. I also consider temporal activity and rumination behavior to be essential indicators ideally. We want at least 50% of the cows ruminating within one to two hours after feeding. These are parameters we monitor almost daily. Another critical factor is particle size, both for corn silage and pre-dried forages which we classify as long fiber. Rumination activity is directly influenced by the physical structure of the fiber and particle length is what effectively triggers rumination. We use the Penn State particle separator as a practical tool for evaluating forage particle size. Our target distribution is to have between two and 5% of the material retained on the top screen. More than 60% on the middle screen and around 50% or less on the bottom screen, specifically when analyzing silage particle length. One of the main factors that influences our chop length decisions is the dry matter content of the forage at the time of harvest. When the forage is drier, it becomes more difficult to achieve proper compaction. And one of the strategies we adopt to improve that condition is to reduce the particle size. As an example, we once had a harvest that went past the optimal point and we ended up chopping at 11 millimeters. Here at Colorado, we are fortunate to have the opportunity to work with a second fiber source, which helps mitigate the effects of that. However, in operations that rely exclusively on corn silage, I consider it somewhat risky, particularly regarding the risk of ruminal acidosis, as we discussed earlier. This is because without sufficient fiber structure, there is no proper ruminal mat formation, which is essential to slow down the degradation rate of corn and other grains. Without that buffering effect, the particles tend to sink to the bottom of the rumen, where fermentation is more intense, thereby increasing the risk of acidosis. Therefore, it is essential to manage this carefully. Ideally, I believe the particle size of corn silage should be around 2.5 centimeters, which can be achieved with a forage harvester setting of 19 millimeters, provided the dry matter content is within the optimal range of 35% to 36%. For long fiber sources, such as pre-dried Tifton grass, we aim for particle sizes between five and six centimeters.